hopefully we will see you all often for all of these things. But I'd like to introduce our guest today, our guest speaker. This is um, Dana Reinert. And Dana is the Director of Communications in the Otolaryngology Department. And she has a tremendous wealth of experience in writing grants, um, team grants. So I think she's going to give a great presentation today. So, all right. Thank you very much, Jenny. You've done a great job of organizing this lecture series. And uh, thank you to Sydney for helping me get set up. So hopefully everything moves smoothly. Uh, welcome to Grants 101. Today we're going to do a basic overview of what grants are, the process. I can't get into too much depth in an hour, but I can tell you I could talk about this for many, many, many hours because I like grants and I'm a little crazy like that. Um, as Jenny said, my name is Dana Reiner. Um, I have 15 years of grants experience, but I'm unlike, I'm not like most of you, I'm assuming. I'm a generalist, so I try and learn as much as I can across a whole bunch of different fields and try and help a whole bunch of different people. I don't like being the PI. I don't like being stuck on a particular project. Probably most of you are trying or are specialists in a particular area, which is perfect for grants. And so as I talk about this, what I'd love for you to do is think about a particular project or research focus or program in your mind so that you can um, connect it um, to the um, information that I'm giving you today. So just to get a feel for myself um, of who's in the room, uh, please raise your hand if you've ever been a PI on a grant. Okay, that's, that's good. Oh, we've got a couple, awesome. Um, raise your hand if you've ever been involved in a grant project, working on research, maybe somebody else is the lead. Okay, good. Raise your hand if you've never been involved in a grant project or don't have really any experience with it. Excellent. I think we'll be, have something for a little, something for everyone. So today we're going to talk about how do you go about developing an idea or landing on something that is fundable, that a, that a funder or somebody that's giving out money would like to uh, give you money to, to do. How do you identify the different types of funders that are out there and identify if it's a good match for what you're proposing to do. We'll talk a little bit about um, the proposal requirements. I can't get into too much depth in an hour um, because it just is variable across all the different funders and all the different funding opportunities. And then I um, want to leave you with um, the idea that you are not alone. There are so many resources available to support you, um, particularly at an institution like KU. We have a wealth of resources, both within the departments as well as institutional um, supports available to you. Uh, before I move on, I'd like to um, just uh, explain. So for those of you that are at a distance, I've um, passed out a few examples of proposals and uh, bio, sketch, um, bio sketches. They're not my intellectual property. They're shared on behalf of the NIH, so they have permission of the people that um, they belong to. Um, if you're interested in that and you're not in the room, or even if you're in the room, you can find all sorts of examples by Googling NIH sample proposals. They have um, a whole bunch of different examples out there for you to check out. But I wanted you to be able to have a proposal in your hand so you can say, I've at least seen what one looks like. All right, so starting at square one, what is a grant? A grant, in the simplest terms, probably has a bunch of paperwork and like a development process involved. You're likely to have, um, um, you need to define what you're going to do, who's going to be involved, what your budget's going to look like. There's usually a fair amount of paperwork associated with a grant. I'm not trying to scare you away. It's definitely something that's doable. They're good problems to solve to try and figure out how to make them work. If um, a funder says to you, I wanna give you a grant and you don't have to do any paperwork, that's awesome. <laughs> there probably is within the institution some paperwork you still have to do as well. In contrast, a grant is not a gift. And I, I, I um, will caution you um, as you leave today, don't think of these as two hard defined categories because really the funder gets to define what is a grant for their organization and what's a gift for their organization. But in the most loose terms, a gift tends to be something where there aren't a lot of strings attached. Usually a donor who wants to give you a gift will say, I'd like to be recognized for this gift, or maybe they don't, maybe they want it to be anonymous, and we'd like for you 
you to, you know, uh, be responsible in the stewardship of this gift. They may, they gave, may give uh, money um, to support um, scholarships, for example, those tend to be gifts. Um, a gift of equipment where they say, we have a piece of equipment we'd like to give you is going to be a gift versus a grant. Again, grants tend to have strings attached. When I say strings, I don't mean like weird things, like they're going to expect you to do something that's inappropriate, but it just usually means that there's a bunch of paperwork associated with it. For grants, um, there's a, a basic grant cycle. Today, we're going to be focusing primarily on the front end of the pre-award uh, part of the cycle, where we're going to talk about how to find funding, how to um, the basics of how to prepare a proposal, um, and a little bit about the submission process. Um, next week, I'll, I'll hit on some of the other things that are later in the cycle, just to help you kind of think about, okay, you've, you've maybe gone through the process, you've submitted a proposal, you got your feedback from the reviewers, unfortunately it wasn't funded. How do you go from there to ensure that you can get the funding in the future? Now let's just pause for a minute and think about how to develop a good idea. If you're working in a lab um, that has, you know, several uh, senior people in there, they probably are defining for you, hopefully, the scope of work. But if you're just getting started, there's a couple things I'd like you to think about so that you can build your capacity and your capabilities and demonstrate to the leaders in your unit that you are ready to get involved beyond um, doing like the bench work or whatever. So you can carve out within a research strategy particular um, capabilities that you could perform within like a six month or a one year period. So um, think a little bit about what you are interested in and what you would like to do. So as we go through this, if you have something kind of concrete to think about. You always wanna consider, are you already planning to do it? I, I would strongly encourage you to not chase the money. There's always a little bit of, okay, what are people willing to fund? Is it a good match with what I'm doing? So you may have to make some small adjustments but if you look at a funding opportunity and you go, that is way outside of what I normally do, but maybe I can do it, that's too much of a stretch. So you want it to be a good match with your priorities. And when I say you are, I'm talking about the organization because generally grants go to organizations, not to individuals. There's some exceptions, but when you think about this, think about the collective of who you're working with. And that's where you would also think about the qualifications. So you wanna think about your qualifications as an individual what do you bring to the table, but also the collaborators. When you're just getting started, I strongly recommend that you think about who um, can be mentors, but also people that can be on your grant proposals that bring um, a breadth and depth that would demonstrate to funders and review committees that you have the ability to accomplish what you're proposing to do. Also think about the competitors. As you, as you think through these different scenarios, imagine the the people you want to be like, or maybe the people you're kind of jealous of, the organizations that are doing similar work, and pay attention to what they're doing, because that can give you some ideas of where you might want to go. We're going to talk a little bit more about aims, um, but just in general, as you're thinking about your idea and how to frame what you want to do for a grant proposal, you're going to be um, outlining kind of short summaries of what you're aiming to do. So you're going to think about that from a hypothesis um, approach. So you think this is what we're gonna do and my hypothesis um, for each of these things um, is very uh, clearly uh, defined. You also wanna consider what resources are necessary for success. So you're, you're likely, if you're submitting a grant proposal, you're likely asking for money, that's generally what it's for. And so you can say, I don't have all of the resources, that's perfectly acceptable. But you also want to consider the, the resources that are available to you right now. So there's the institutional resources. You've got the buildings and the labs and the lights are on and all those sort of things. If you don't have a particular piece of equipment that's necessary to do the work, then that will be a gap in the resources that you need. So you either need to get it funded by a, a grantor or find some way to get it donated or look for another thing that you can focus on. So you need to make sure you have all the inputs that are necessary to be successful as you carve out a scope of work, which is basically how you define what you're going to accomplish during the grant period. 
So now let's let's look at this specifically in terms of NIH. Um, my examples today are primarily NIH focused um, or medical um, oriented institution, but also um, a lot of funders will say use the NIH template for biosketches or whatever. So a lot of what I talk about today, um, I'm falling back on NIH as the example because I think it's probably the most relevant for you. But when you think about idea development um, in the NIH um, terminology, this is what the review committees are looking at, the review panels. On the uh, right of the slide, um, I tried to demonstrate kind of the review process in short. There's initially an administrative review process where people go and they say, did they follow the rules? And some proposals will not make it past the administrative review process, but those that do will move on to a scientific review and they'll be scored. And this the, these impact areas are what they're going to be looking at. So your idea, your scope of work, your collaborators all need to be, you need to think about it in terms of significance, the investigators, your innovation, all that sort of stuff. I meant, I meant to say earlier, we're going to um, have the slides available to you. So if, don't feel like you have to capture every single thing. I want to um, emphasize very strongly the importance of finding a match for the funding um, opportunity and what you're proposing to do. I've seen a lot of PIs try and stretch and um, that's challenging both in the proposal development process because you have to really kind of define what you're doing and figure out who has the capabilities and it's, it's very challenging to do that. But also it's unlikely that you're gonna get funded because there's probably people that focus in that that are your competitors that are more likely to be focused. So think about What's a good match for you, your priorities, your career trajectory, your lab, um, your area? <clears throat> All right, now let's talk a little bit about the different types of funding um, opportunities, funders that are out there. Um, as you might imagine, this is just a couple examples. There are probably a million out there, um, so many different types of funders. There's federal agencies, um, which have lots of money, um, lots of rules. Oh, I wanted to make a plug for voting. Make sure you're voting and paying attention to the people that you're voting for because they're the people that decide if there's money for the NIH to give out. Um, so there's like the NIH, there's NSF, there's cross-cutting programs. And I'm not gonna get into too much detail with this, but when you hear SBIR, STTR, those are the sort of mechanisms where lots of different agencies are giving out money to do that type of work. SBIRs and STTRs are basically for small business um, peel offs. So say you're working in a lab, you guys come up with some new technique, some new technology, some new tool, and you're like, we could sell this. You can peel that off into a company. Just know that KU has intellectual um, property rights associated with that. So those, those um, cut across all types of different funding agencies. And SBIR is just one example. There's also um, all sorts of foundations and private organizations and corporate organizations. If you want to start really small, it's not research oriented, but like Target gives out grants. There's all sorts of organizations that do this. Focusing in on NIH specifically, there's a wealth of funding opportunities. You're going to hear me say funding opportunities which also in short is FOA or RFP or RFA, which is basically the NIH saying, we have money we wanna give out in this particular area, they have specific guidelines associated with it. Again, I'm just giving you a couple of examples here. I can't get into too much detail on all the different types of opportunities, even under just the one funder NIH, uh, but there's the R series, which are all of the research oriented grants. The R01 is kind of the gold standard, that's the big money. You want to work your way up to that. So maybe start with an R03 or an R21, which are smaller pots of money, um, more exploratory. They're looking for opportunities to invest in you and your, your research group or your organization at a level where you're just getting started. You're trying to get that preliminary data. Maybe you have you know, your first wave of preliminary data, but you, you need a stepping stone to the R01 where you're competing with all the, the top players. 
Um, for professional development, if you're just getting started, you might look at the F series. There's fellowship opportunities for trainees. Um, if you are like assistant professor level, then you want to probably look, well, it's, it's not just assistant professor, but for the faculty, you can look at the K series, which are also career development opportunities. I'll, I'll talk on this a little bit more as I go through, but just wanted you to know that there's a whole bunch of different opportunities. So um, there's probably you know something for everybody. So when I first started getting started in grants, um, honestly, it was it was pretty painful. My degrees are in English. I got hired as a research assistant, and they said, "Go out there and find us grant opportunities in X, Y, Z." And it was long enough ago that you know I couldn't really find a lot of the information as readily as you can today. The good news is that there's lots of opportunities to find this information. Um, you can download the Grants.gov app, which is a very simple app where you can search for funding opportunities put in keywords um, and see what comes up. You can save your searches, you can set up alerts. Um, I just started doing that. I honestly, um, mostly just take advantage of whatever's being fed to me. Um, the institutional has lots of listservs and opportunities that are coming into our emails. So that's one way that you can see it. Um, you can also look, um, do some research for research funding opportunities in the NIH reporter um, and the foundation center. I also recommend, again, like think about what your competitors are doing, pay attention to news releases, because that'll go, oh, I didn't even know there was a funder that was funding in this particular area. So um, just kind of have a general scan strategy and then a drill down strategy where you can go, okay, I need to learn exactly what's available. Um, on the most simple level, if you're in a group that, um, is looking for like continuation funding and that sort of thing. You probably don't have to think too hard about it. Just you're looking at the same programs and looking for paying attention to the deadlines and the changes and requirements and whether or not they're being funded by the government. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about how to actually um, prepare a proposal. And again, I'm not trying to scare you away. Like I really think that every single person should get involved. If you are never gonna chase a grant, just think about this in terms of Proposals. You're always making proposals to people, even if it's your spouse, you're saying, let's go do this or whatever, or we need the money to do this. So proposal, everyone needs a good proposal skill set. Specifically for grants, um, we have institutional policies we need to follow. There's the NIH general instructions, which cross all, every time you do a, a, an NIH grant proposal, you have to follow those general instructions. They're like how to format it and that sort of thing. Then there's the guidelines for a particular program. So um, within the SBIR or, you know, NCI, um, National um, Cancer, you know, within those areas, they have their own specific guidelines. And then there's the guidelines associated with each funding opportunity. I'm not going to get too more into the details on that, but just know that there's going to be a whole bunch of instructions, which means you don't have to memorize everything you don't have to be an expert because it's simply they're going to say, here are the instructions and then you follow the instructions. People can help. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about SPA here in a minute, but there are institutional resources available to help you. Don't do it on your own. There's no need to. So like I was talking about specifically for an NIH, you can see um, on this side that there is the how to apply, which is the basic application guide that spans across all of NIH. They have uh, video, video tutorials. They have um, sample proposals, like I mentioned earlier, sample bio sketches. Then they also have within each of the different types of grant mechanisms, whether it's the R series for research, F series for fellowships, they have specific guidelines associated with that, instructions, examples, and that sort of thing. So like I was saying, the funder will decide what type of proposal they're wanting you to submit. I wanted you to get a feel for the different types of proposals that, you, that might be requested. The full proposal is like the standard. So if you're submitting an R01 for the NIH, then you're just gonna go straight to the full proposal in most cases. Some funders will ask for you to submit a letter of intent on the front end, which may be competitive and it may not. If they ask for a letter of, when I see um, guidelines or a call for proposals, I always look to see, 
um, what the deadlines are, and then I check to see if there's a letter of intent involved. One, because that would be a, you know, the, the soonest deadline, but also because there's opportunities there. If it's competitive, then you need to take it very seriously. You, it, you submit an, a letter of intent, they go through a review process, and they decide who to select to invite for full proposals. If it's non-competitive and they say it's not required, I strongly recommend that you still submit the letter of intent. Usually if it's non-competitive, then that means it's non-binding, which means you can change your title, you can change your collaborators. They just wanna, usually just trying to figure out how many reviewers do they need, what topic um, expertise do they need for their reviewers, the people, the reviewers are the people that are making, um, they're scoring and making decisions about whether or not your proposal seems um, fundable and a good match and you know, the best. Um, what I've seen with letter of intent um, that I love is that sometimes when you submit them, you'll get an email back from the program officer. The program officer is, the, there's usually um, at least one program officer for each program that it's their job, they're getting paid, they're devoting all of their time to helping you learn about their program and to be successful in the proposal process. Don't be scared of them, reach out to them, but if you submit a letter of intent, they're likely to respond back and say, thank you for the letter of intent, and then you've got their email address. And they may say, I'd be happy to meet with you or talk with you by phone, take advantage of those opportunities. I just have the rest of those up there to say, you know, they may want you to write a letter proposal. They may want you to do a mini proposal before they do a full proposal. There's all sorts of different types. Um, also, if you get funded, which is, you know, super awesome, but you know that it's only going to be a two year or five year time frame for the funding, you may be looking at two different <coughs> options as you get towards the end. If you haven't spent all of the money and you need a little more time to do the work, you can request a no cost extension, which is basically saying I need a little more time. I don't need more money. I just need to be able to wrap this up. Um, can I have another year or another six months? Funders all have different rules around those sort of things, but don't be afraid to do that. Just know that you want to be um, sh demonstrating um, that you're moving things along. You don't want to be like, I haven't done anything in the last year or anything like that. You just want to be able to show like a valid excuse or a reason for that justification would be if you um, proposed in your original proposal that you were going to hire an expert in a particular area or a postdoc or whatever, <clears throat> and you um, had a hard time finding a qualified person. So maybe they didn't come in until six months into the project or something like that. That's a perfectly valid justification for why you might need a no cost extension. Um, renewals and continuations are also big. So pay attention to whether or not the funder will entertain proposals for renewal and continuation. So say you have a five year um, pot of money, you've got a great scope of work, but you're proposing um, a phase project that's over 10 years. So you, you do your first five years and then you say, okay, I'd like to apply for continuation funding to continue with this project as, as outlined in the original proposal because you had it phased out. Oh, and I wanted to say something about application forms. Um, don't get too excited if it's an application form because sometimes the, those are the hardest ones to do because they tend to have like, you know, limited character blocks where you have to fit it in. And so you really need to, if it's an application form, you really need to think through and distill your idea because it's more challenging than it might seem to fill out a form um, where it's kind of, you know, you only have 100 characters or whatever. <clears throat> All right, so specifically looking at NIH, um, Again, this is like a great oversimplification of the requirements for NIH, but I wanted to give you an idea of what they're looking for. And again, that's why I circulated a couple examples so that you could actually see what they look like. Um, there's always forms, and usually um, forms do not need to be filled out by you. Um, they, there's the sponsored programs office on campus that can help with the forms. There's a department and grants administrator that can help with that sort of stuff. So knowing like our employer identification number and all that sort of stuff can be auto, you know, managed by those offices that know where that information is. And, but anyway, so there's forms associated with all of these. You're going to have your specific aims, which I'll talk a little bit more in just a minute. Um, you're going to have your research plan, which is how we all tend to think. So 
your research plan is your methodology, it's your actions, it's, what, it's your activities, it's what you're going to do. We, we all kind of tend to think of, oh, what are you going to do on Friday or what are you going to do next week or whatever. So that tends to be, that kind of thinking is your research strategy or research plan. Obviously for research and that sort of thing, you're going to want to have um, reference um, citations. So that's kind of a, um, a basic requirement that hopefully you're all uh, familiar with, but I will uh, make a head nod to sometimes when you're preparing for a proposal, you can get overwhelmed trying to do your lit review of like everything that's out there. So you might want to take advantage of um, software like EndNote or whatever to keep all of your thoughts organized. I've seen some, some PIs really struggle at the end to be like, okay, now I need to have all of my citations like organized. So just do it as you go. Um, that'll make it easier on you. Uh, facilities and equipment are exactly what it sounds like. You tend to have to have a description of what's available on campus, in your lab, in your wherever you're, you're working. So it's as simple as we have the computers, we have the equipment, we have um, access to core um, support facilities and that sort of thing. Um, I'd recommend that you, I'm going to use the word boilerplate, um, capture this kind of information. Boilerplate's the sort of thing that you can use over and over again for proposals. So capture that for yourself, but also work with your collaborators. Um, there's probably um, senior people that already have descriptions that you can work from. Just make sure you update it to make it specific to your proposal. Um, as I noted earlier, it's not a gift, it's a grant. So generally you're gonna need to, need to have a detailed budget. Even if the funder says that you don't have to have a detailed budget, you just say, I want $25,000, the institution will require that you have a detailed budget, so just go ahead and plan to do that. Next week, I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, budgeting and some of the budget pitfalls and, and things you want to avoid to make it more painless, I guess. Um, so I have budget on there twice because your budget detail or your modular budget is going to be like the spreadsheet kind of thing. Um, modular in NIH speak means that you say, I, here's my personnel and my, my costs associated with personnel, but for supplies, I just need $20,000 and you don't have to detail it for them. I recommend going the modular route whenever you can, because when you get the money, you have that much flexibility. Think of it, if you haven't done this before, um, I always, when I first started, I always thought of it as like grocery shopping, which is super basic. But like, think about what you actually need. You're itemizing your costs. You're budgeting for what it's going to cost. You're going to have what you anticipated or what you um, guessed the cost were going to be. And then once you get the money, you're going to have your actuals of what it actually costed. As you move along in your career, you'll have a better feel for the actuals. If you have no idea where to start on this, this is another opportunity. Um, in your lab or, or wherever you're working, ask your supervisor for an opportunity. Maybe you're helping to order or maybe you're helping, you know, maybe it's a general thing where everyone just needs to make sure that if we're starting to ro run low on a supply, you say something about it or you help order. Ask them if you can like say, you know, what's our budget for the next three months or whatever and ask them if you can work on tracking, you know, try to anticipate what the costs are gonna be and then track the actual expenses. That gives you a little bit of practice on that sort of thing and thinking about what things cost. Um, I was saying that earlier about scope of work as well. They may appreciate it if you go, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on a kind of mini plan for, um, and this would be beyond like your own research focus. Like try to take a, um, a leadership role within your unit and say, I can, I can step up and help plan this because that'll give you a little bit of experience. Subcontract documentation, I just wanted to give a head nod to that. Um, if you are working with anyone outside of KU, so anyone that is not on KU payroll, and when I say KU, I'm talking about literally the whole system. So if they're at KU Lawrence and they're on payroll, they're a full-time employee, then they're not a subcontract entity. Anyone outside of KU, if they're involved in your project, they're gonna get resources from the grant, it's going to require a subcontract budget um, and scope of work and that sort of thing. Just um, keep in mind that if you have that kind of a situation, which happens all the time, I'm not trying to steer you away from it, but if you have that sort of situation, you need to build in a little more time on the front end so that you can get all the paperwork in place 
before the deadline. Sometimes it's like, oh, we're not getting what we need from the subcontract organization and you know it's due today or whatever. Just build in a little extra time for that. Um, and then you'll have the bio sketches of all the personnel involved that are at um, key personnel level. So key personnel for NIH speak are all of the people that have um, decision-making authority over the research activities. So they're, it's gonna be the PI, but it's like the senior faculty that are involved and anyone, it really can be down to any level, but anyone that has decision-making authority is gonna be in the key personnel category. From a title level, it tends to be anyone that's director or assistant professor and up. Um, coordinators also can fit there, um, depending on their level of uh, responsibility for the project. And then in NIH speak, then the other category is other personnel, so that would be everybody else. So key personnel you need bio sketches for, other personnel you don't. I did want to say there though, and this is why I circulated some bio sketch examples, um, another thing that you can do immediately, even if you don't have a proposal in mind, you're not involved, is to make sure you have a really solid NIH bio sketch. Have it ready to go, because the moment they go, hey, we want to put you in on this project and we need your bio sketch, you're going to go, ah! Oh. But it's also a good exercise in thinking through the qualifications that the NIH is looking for so that you, you could go, okay, well, I don't have the publications to put in this category. That's what you need to be working on. Or I don't have any, you know, grant experience. Well, that's, you can start working on some mini, some little grants. So one of the things you can walk away with today is to just start working on your bio sketch. If you already have one, great. Just keep, keep it up to date as you go and as you update your CV. I'm also going to give a head nod to imposter syndrome. You are all qualified to be involved in grants. So if you sit and you're like, I'm trying to develop my bio sketch and I don't have anything to put on there, you need to ask um, a colleague, um, someone that's nice to you, <laughs> to help you think about what can go on there. Because you, I guarantee every single one of you, because you're sitting in the room, because you're here at KU, you have the qualifications. So, so don't, don't go, I don't have anything to put on there. Um, and then um, usually there's letters, um, and I'll talk a little bit more uh, about that later, but um, usually you have to have letters of commitment um, from the, the major players. If you have other organizations involved, people from outside the institution, there's almost always a requirement that there be some kind of a commitment later that spells out exactly what they're committing to. That's required usually to go with the proposal. Internally, KU will also usually ask for a particular scope of work and a little more detail internally to make sure that when you get funded, that other organization ends up doing what they promised they were gonna do. You don't wanna just have it be a verbal conversation. All right, so let's think a little bit about aims for a moment. Aims are, again, like I was saying, is kind of the brief description of what you will accomplish, what you're aiming to do. Usually you want it to be hypothesis driven. So if you can't, so it may be easiest to think of it in terms of hypothesis and then frame the action that goes with it. Um, or if you think action ori oriented first, that's fine. Um, but then you wanna ask yourself, okay, can I um, identify what the hypothesis that I'm testing that goes with this aim. I have the big red um, X thing up there to um, remind me to say that you don't want your aims to be stacked. So if aim two hinges on successful accomplishment of aim one and aim one doesn't work, you're gonna have to go back to the funding agency and say, I can't do aim two and three because aim one didn't work, what do I do? So you wanna make sure your aims are related. Obviously they all need to be part of a related scope of work, but you don't want them to hinge on each other to the point where you won't be able to accomplish it. So as you're planning it, go, okay, when I get to the aim three stage, what do I need in order to be successful with this? And if, it, if one of the answers to that is that you need aim one and aim two data or whatever, then that's, that's gonna cause some problems for you. Now I've seen proposals funded that where the aims were totally stacked and they relied on each other. You can get away with that, but if you read the NIH guidelines and the, the recommendations, you'll see that they don't recommend that you stack them. All 
All right, I hope you guys aren't feeling too overwhelmed, but in case you are, and in any case, I just wanted you to know a little bit about the institutional resources that are available. Um, I will admit I have a love-hate relationship with SPA. I love them because they keep me out of trouble. I maybe don't love them as much because they're constantly going, oh, that's not quite right, you know? So just know that there's a bunch of rules but their job is to keep you out of trouble. Their job is to make sure that the institution doesn't get in trouble with the federal government, rely on their expertise. They're there to help you. Um, when you're planning a proposal, you need to give them a heads up that it's coming. I always, as soon as I hear from a PI that they're planning on submitting a proposal, I immediately send a notification to SPA and I say we're planning, or to pre-awards and I say we're planning a proposal. Um, we're anticipating, you know, here's the guidelines and what we're going to be writing to and can you let us know who's assigned to us and that way I get right up front who the people are that are assigned to help and then I start bugging them. <laughs> I ask them all sorts of questions and I check in with them as I'm going along and when I say I, it doesn't have to be the PI, it doesn't have to be the research personnel on the project, it can be your grants administrator, but make sure someone's greasing the wheels with pre-awards, keeping them happy, keeping them involved. Because when you get to the last couple of days and you're like, I don't have my research plan done yet. And they're like, we want to review it and make sure everything's okay. They're going to work with you. Okay. I got some good friends over there. So I'm just kind of giving them a hard time. They don't even know it. But um, once you um, are working on a proposal, it's going to be the pre-awards group. Once you get the grant, pre-awards is going to pass it off to the post-award team. And then they will help make sure you're following the rules. You're spending your money. They're there to help you. Um, effort cert certification, I have that up there to remind me to say that um, if you have people involved in your projects, you have to document what their time commitment's going to be during the proposal stage. You have to say they're going to devote 50% time to this over the whole year. And then when you get the money, you have to be able to confirm that they're spending their time on it, excuse me, as well. I want to talk a little bit about match, but I'll come back to that later. So um, you, there's also a contracts office, there's legal counsel, there's regulatory management as well. Um, when you read in the NIH guidelines that you should use the assist program to submit a proposal, there is literally an assist program for NIH, which you could use, but K, um, KU has this Caillou system it's a system to system proposal delivery system <laughs> that we use internally. So um, I want to do, if you haven't seen it before, I want you to have a couple um, views of what it looks like. It's a very simple system. It's um, not, it doesn't have like a whole lot of bells and whistles, but basically you can see that it has all of the different requirements, it has the form field, and then at the bottom, you can't see it here, but at the bottom, it will have all the warnings for things that are not right, things that are missing. And so it blocks you straight through it. So again, if you're planning a, an NIH proposal, your PI needs to get set up with access in Caillou so that they can see it in there. You can grant access to the different people on your team to be able to upload documents, to fill things out. And then SPA, the, the pre-awards team, can see it as well. You don't have to give them access. They automatically can see it and they will help with all the forms. And then if you're doing a repeat submission, you, you submitted a proposal, it wasn't funded, and then you're gonna submit it again with some changes, you can just copy it over. And a lot of the information will copy over. You don't want it to be literally the exact same copy of what you submitted because if it wasn't funded the first time, there's a reason. So you wanna make sure you're making the changes that are recommended. So Caius. Also, AOR, raise your hand if you've heard of the authorized organizational representatives. Anybody know who it is? I think you could be giving this lecture. I can see you back there, head nodding. <laughs> so um, within the institution, we have a person that is authorized to sign off on proposals, contracts, incoming money, that sort of thing. Um, you'll hear, hear people say AOR. So I just wanted you to know there is a particular individual that that is their responsibility. It's Jamie Caldwell. Um, for the KUMC um, RI, Research Institute. There are a couple people under him that can sign off on his behalf, but essentially he's the signer, the signer for this stuff. 
if somebody says we want to give you a grant we just need you to fill out this little form and all on the form that they ask for is like the title how much money you want and the time frame but then there's a signature line for the authorized organizational representative it has to go through SPA. They're the only ones that can sign. And the good news is that means they're responsible for making sure that we're following all the rules. So you don't want to be the AOR. Nobody here wants to be the AOR. Let Jamie Caldwell do that. Thank you to Dr. Nalani for reminding me that I should probably talk about research compliance a little bit. Um, so the main thing I wanted you to know, you guys are all probably familiar with IRB research compliance requirements is, um, uh, the little box over on the left when you are going through the award uh, the, the pre-award proposal process you have to fill out like a red cap form for pre-awards which is the basic information the title who's involved um, but there's questions about research compliance they want to know do you have your irb approved um, are human subjects involved um, et cetera et cetera it's okay if your irb is pending at the proposal stage. Some funders will require that you have it approved, your IRB approved, before you submit your proposal. So you'll want to watch for that. But most funders are okay with knowing that it's at least pending. You've put it in for review. But when you get the money, you have to have the IRB approval before you get started. Anything involving um, that's under the compliance umbrella, you need to make sure you're following those rules. You guys probably know the rules better than I do, but I just wanted you to know you don't have to have it approved most of the time uh, before you submit the proposal. There are a lot of other institutional resources. Some of these are pretty obvious, but I want to remind you we have a library here that has all sorts of um, uh, resources they can help you doing um, like a lit search and that sort of thing. Um, we have our information resources office. They can help you with software if you need access to particular types of software. Um, do, does anyone know that we have a biostatistics shared resource? So we've got some biostatistics on, on campus. You can build them into your proposal if you want to um, pay them for their services. As far as I know, they don't come free. So you want to think about that on the proposal end on whether or not they need to be built into your budget. There's the integrated, um, integrated Administrative Support Core that spans across a whole bunch of different areas and a whole bunch of other core facilities. So um, Here's what I wanted to say. Um, I wanted to just make sure you're not doing this alone. Like make sure you're thinking about the experts and the resources that are available to you because that's what's going to make you successful. I've seen PIs try to do the lone wolf thing where they submit it on their own. They write the whole thing on their own. They do the whole thing on their own. They put it in and then time and time again, they're not funded. Don't waste your time with that sort of thing. Like reach out, build your connections. Um, you'll meet all sorts of people, it's awesome. All right, I just have a couple slides left. I want to talk a little bit about the common pitfalls. So an obvious one, deadlines and approvals. We do have an approval process within the institution. I promise I'm not trying to do a commercial for pre-awards, <laughs> but you want to be aware of the internal timelines for this sort of thing. You're going to want to be pay paying attention to deadlines. They sneak up on you. Um, a common problem um, that we run into is like a mismatch on scope. You put in a proposal to a program that that's not what they fund. So you want to pay really close attention to what the programs are saying that they're interested in funding, the, the um, particular funding opportunity announcements and what they say for the requirements. Reach out to the program officer um, because the program officer is getting paid to help you. Call them, email them. You don't want to like be obnoxious, but you want them to uh, recognize your name in a positive way, that you have great ideas, you ask good questions, you're trying to get it right. Um, I also <laughs> here want to say, um, I was about 10 years into my career and um, I was meeting, I, I used to coordinate the Big 12 Engineering Consortium and we were meeting with some federal funding agencies and sitting in a, a meeting with a program officer and things were going really great and he kind of gave a head nod to like you're going to get this funding you guys put in a proposal you're going to get this funding and that was the moment when i realized grants are not as competitive as you might expect work your network get to know the people get to know the people that are serving on the review panels look for opportunities to serve on the review panels and get to know all of the people 
it, I mean, I, it's unfortunate, but it's not just about competition. It is about who you know. And the good news is that we all have an opportunity to play that game. It's not just a good old boys club. Every single one of us can get to know the people that are involved. We can show them what we have to offer and we can, we can all be awesome. I said um, already, but I'm gonna talk about budget more next week, but budget is a really, um, it's kind of like a magnifying lens or um, a, a peek into what you're actually planning. When I serve as a reviewer, I go to the budget first. It's the very first thing I look at because I can tell from a budget if they have a solid plan, if they've got the qualifications that they need, if they've got all of the resources that are gonna be essential. So don't just think, oh, you know, budget, somebody else will put that together or somebody like a, a grants administrator in your office says, you know, I drafted a budget for you. Don't go, oh, it looks great. You need to really pay attention to your budget, make sure that it, it works. And the other thing is that if you get the money and your budget didn't make any sense, you're going to have a hard time spending the money. So again, it's like shopping, like make sure you've got a, a solid plan of what you're going to spend your money on. Poorly written letters are very common, especially if you're reapplying. So when you're asking your collaborators for letters, what I always do is I give them kind of a frame. Here's what we need in that letter. Here are the key points. So like the title of the proposal, you know, the particular things they're committing to. You had a verbal conversation with them. Send them an email and say, here's what I think we agreed to. If you could include that in the letter, that would be great. Um, I see recycled letters all the time where they'll go, oh, well, we just, you know, we pulled the letter from before. You know, if it's got an old date or obvious stuff, like that's going to be a problem for the reviewers. They're going to go, what? <laughs> Um, same thing with personal statements. So in the bio sketch, there's a section that's the personal statement. Um, you can have like a general overview of what you're interested in, what your qualifications are, but I recommend that you customize, and NIH does as well, um, that you customize that personal statement for every proposal you submit. And then knowing that you're going to be doing this a lot, save each version <laughs> because you're, you probably have, you know, a number of different types of priorities. So you want to be able to go, oh, here's my personal statement that's around X, Y, and Z. And here's my personal statement that's around this or that. If you submit a proposal with bio sketches that have unrelated personal statements, you're just kind of shooting yourself in the foot because you're not giving the reviewers what they need to know about your qualifications and what's most important. Oh, I also wanted to talk a little bit about personnel time. So, um, was, it's super complicated, but I'm going to just say in general, you need to have the right amount of personnel time on a project. It's really hard to anticipate that if you don't have a lot of experience. So talk to the people around you that have some experience with, with budgeting personnel time. Um, NIH does not um, uh, encourage or, or require that you have um, what we call match. So when you put in a grant proposal and you request money, that's your request. And in your budget, you may also have your match or what the institution's going to be providing that you don't need the, the grant funder to provide. Um, you just need the two to, to fit together to be the, the right amount of time. So if you only, let's just say, for example, you have um, an expensive PI. The PI makes a lot of money. You can't fit all of their time into the budget request. The institution sometimes will allow you to use institutional match where the institution's already paying for their time. You just need to make sure that the total amount of time is what they need to devote to the project, that you can document it and be able to show that they put the time into it. Um, while I say that, and honestly, most of the ones I've done lately have had match, the institution doesn't like it because if we're proposing to do something, we're trying to get a funder to pay for it, it's best to get the funder to pay for all of it. So that's you know, what you wanna aim for. But if the guidelines, some of the smaller grants will say, you cannot include any key personnel in their request. You can only do you know, learners, postdocs, that sort of thing. Then you're required to do it essentially. And so the institution will approve it most of the time. There's all these strings. All right. I talked about most of these. Um, if you have an opportunity to serve on a review panel, this may seem weird, but like there's neighborhood grants and all sorts of like lower, smaller things that are in our area, um, society opportunities. 
sign up to serve on that because it gives you such a great insight to what reviewers are looking at. You'll find that they don't read every page. They don't read most of the pages. They're looking at particular things. And then that way, when you get involved in that sort of thing, you can figure out what's most valuable to that funder um, and to that you know, review group. Read successful proposals. Anything funded by the federal government is um, subject to open records. The only problem is, is it takes a while to get it, right? So most people that have a pretty long career trajectory already that have been doing this for a long time might entertain the idea if you, if you write them. I've had people cold call. That's actually one of my first jobs as a GRA was to cold call people and ask them for proposals. I didn't realize at the time they were kind of torturing me when they asked me to do that. I called so many people just out of the blue, junior person. I had no idea what I was talking about. And I got proposals all the time. So you guys can do that too. Reach out to people. Probably they're not going to give it to you if it's an exact overlap with your expertise and what you're doing. But if they are more senior, they've, you know, they're not trying to actively seek funding right now. They, um, it's not a total overlap. They might be willing to share theirs with you. And there's examples online as well. Um, mentors are good, collaborating is good. And then also, I'm gonna talk about this a lot more next week, but reviewer feedback can be painful, but that they're telling you exactly what you need to do. So pay attention to that. Any questions?